and spends as much time as he does. Um, and so maybe it's best to see chapters 1 to 4 not simply as the first of a laundry list of problems, but uh, maybe, as we've suggested, the core problem that keeps rearing its head in other ways. Okay, uh, okay chapter 5 and 6, Paul is making a call to discipline uh, because of the immorality uh, that is uh, rampant, really, among the group, it seems. And then from chapter 7 to 15, we're calling it, Paul is not responding to reports, but he's responding to questions. For the most part, the things that are said now concerning this, now concerning that. Paul is going through the things that they wrote to him and had questions about. Uh, We've broken that up into two sections. Uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10, Paul is dealing with what kind of matters? Personal, we've called it. Uh, Again, that may not be the best word. I'm still thinking of if there's a better word. But in chapter 7, he deals with chapter 7, marriage, chapters 8, 9, and 10, meat sacrifice to idols, okay? Then in chapter 11, there's a shift to talk about not personal, but what kind of matters. The assembly, maybe corporate is a, is a better word, uh, if all of 11 to 14 isn't in the you know, worship assembly as we think of it. But uh, the first part of chapter 11 deals with yeah, the head covering or gender roles between men and women, whatever's uh, exactly going on. And then the section we're in now, the second half of 11 deals with the Lord's Supper. So let's pick up there. We had gotten uh, basically through most of it. But uh, I want to go back because we're going to spend some time talking about application. So I do want the text to be in front of us the best we can. So let's read this section that we had talked some about on Sunday and then summarize it. And then we'll read and discuss uh, where we didn't get to Sunday. But uh, going back to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17, Paul says, But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the, fa- in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Let me just stop real quick because I didn't address verse 19, which is a confusing verse on Sunday. He says there needs to be division so that those who are approved would be uh, made evident. What does he mean by that? It's kind of two options. One is that he's referring to those approved by God. This would be the idea that that in some senses, divisions uh, reveal who is faithful to God and who's not, or who has the right attitude, who has the wrong attitude. So that's one option. Option two would be that he means approved by people, right? That Remember we said there's a status issue here. So these divisions in the Lord's Supper is showing who values the status, uh, you know, in society as uh, rich, important people. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it reveals maybe that bad attitude or that bad way of thinking. Um, but uh, a couple of options there for verse 19. But continue on in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 11. Therefore, he says, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For you in eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And this I will not praise you. For I received, verse 23, from the Lord, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay, that's about as far as we got on Sunday. And we saw these two things. That in this first section, Paul is uh, uh, saying that you're not taking the Lord's Supper because uh, you're doing it totally for yourselves. We imagine this this, uh, scene that Paul is describing where the rich, the important, the well-to-do come together on their own. Uh, they sit around the table and they eat uh, and drink to excess, Paul says. And then, you know, the poor maybe come in later, uh, having worked all day. They uh, maybe sit at a lower place, you know, sit, uh, in these times where you sat around the table was a big deal. Sat in a lower place, didn't get as much to eat. 
And uh, Paul says, this is, uh, this is horrible. And so he, he points them back to what the Lord's Supper really is all about. If it is the Lord's Supper after all, then uh, think about you know, the, the stark contrast in what they're doing and the picture Paul paints going back to that night when Jesus being betrayed breaks the bread as a symbol of his broken body, uh, pleads with his disciples to do this every week, remembering him and the sacrifice he has made and the covenant that they have with God because of his blood that he is going to shed, remembering that and proclaiming that, uh, keeping in mind his coming again. Okay, so Paul is pointing them back to that moment in order to uh, remedy the selfishness of the way that they are currently taking the Lord's Supper. Okay? Then, uh, the rest of this, let's read and discuss. Chapter 11, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not, drink, does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Verse 33, So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that he will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Okay, um, I want us to think about what Paul is saying in these verses. Again, in light of the problem that he has set forth uh, and the solution that he's trying to offer. So, um, I wish in some ways, oh, for more than one reason probably, that we weren't behind. I think uh, talking about some of this would be helpful in hearing what you have to say about it, but it seems to me that what we're going to see is, uh, in this section, is familiar phrases that we use quite a bit, especially in the taking of the Lord's Supper, comments around the Lord's table, but maybe we don't always place them back in the context of what's going on in Corinth and what Paul is really saying. So, for instance, I'm sure we're familiar with the idea of partaking in an unworthy manner. We, we pray that oftentimes, that we would take in a worthy manner when we take the Lord's Supper. But what does Paul mean to partake in an unworthy manner in light of what he has just talked about? Well, I think we would go back to the way that they are taking it, the manner in which they are taking it in Corinth. It's all about them. It's focused on themselves uh, enjoying the meal. So maybe there's just a fleshly, carnal side to this. Uh, clearly, in taking the Lord's Supper, they are using that as an opportunity to uh, exalt themselves and, and, you know, their own status and look down their nose, despise the church of God, he says. Look down their nose at their weaker or uh, poorer brethren. Okay? Um, so maybe partaking in an unworthy manner specifically has to do with focusing on self and not on, as he's drawn their attention back to uh, the, the sacrifice of Jesus and the supper that he instituted. Uh, in a similar way, verse 28 says that each man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and the drink of the cup. So again, examining the motives uh, in taking this. About self or about the Lord. 29 and 31, he uses this phrase to judge the body rightly. Okay? Um, verse 29, he says that you bring judgment on yourself if you're not judging the body rightly. And then verse 31, he says, if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. So in verse 29, at least, he said, judge the body rightly. Which body do we think he's talking about? What body are you judging when you're uh, taking the Lord's Supper? Could be your own, there's at least three options here, right? Could be your own body, could be Jesus' body, or it could be the church, okay? And maybe in some sense it's all of those. I mean, especially the idea of Jesus' body broken, that's the symbol of the bread, and the body of believers, the church, which we'll see again tonight, those two things I think definitely fit together. Because think about it. The problem is that they are despising the church of God in their selfish partaking of the Lord's Supper. The solution is to remember Jesus' body broken, which the bread symbolizes. So those two things go together. Remember uh, back in chapter 8, Paul, in talking about offending your brother, causing them to sin, ruining them by your own uh, foolish actions. Remember he says, 
you have ruined your brother. Remember the rest of that phrase? For whom Christ died. So the remembrance of Christ's sacrifice goes together with the harm that you have done to the body of Christ uh, in, in terms of your brothers and sisters. Yes, Robert. I see. So, uh, oh, you're saying that, that distinguishes from, from the, your, uh, the, the physical body, if that's what we mean by body. Okay, there you go. We could go on five, six, seven options. But uh, anyway, so, uh, but again, the idea is like, like the examining yourself, you're, you're judging, you're thinking about uh, uh, what this is really all about. Maybe the hardest part of this is in verse 30 when Paul says, For this reason, many of you are weak and sick and a number have fallen asleep, or a number asleep. Some of your translation may just say, which I think that's maybe the euphemism, many of you are dead. Um, what in the world is Paul talking about? I think we first like recoil in horror and say, surely it's not the case that there has been a sickness and death that's broken out among the Corinthians because of their failure to take the Lord's Supper correctly. Um, do we have to rule that out? Is it impossible that, that God would have caused or a consequence of their sin would be sickness and death amongst them? It's not impossible. Um, really, this is one of those verses we have to say, again, they know what he's talking about. We don't. There are other options. There are maybe a, a way to metaphorically understand what Paul is saying here. Um, obviously, the, the trouble we get ourselves into is, is interpreting from the other side, right? is we see sickness and death, and we want to judge, jump to, oh, this is God's judgment, when we don't know that, okay? Um, but if Paul is saying this is happening because, as a judgment on your, uh, your sin in the congregation, well, if he said that, then we know that, that, may be, uh, that that's what's going on, if he means it literally and not metaphorically. But again, this idea of because they're not using their judgment in how they discern Jesus' sacrifice, his body, uh, the body of believers, and thinking of each other, taking this as communion together, sharing with each other and the Lord, they're then being disciplined uh, or judged in some way for that. Okay, so he says, in wrapping up verse 33, wait for one another. Um, th this, this, I think, kind of uh, finishes out the twofold focus of the Lord's Supper. And I've really just referred to it, but we talk about the Lord's Supper being communion. Um, this was also mentioned back in chapter 10 when he talked about the Lord's Supper. You're sharing. You're sharing in the table. To eat together is to share. So who are we sharing with? Who are we communing with when we take the Lord's Supper? With each other and with Jesus. And you see how these instructions in 1 Corinthians 11 kind of hit both of those uh, equally you know, strong. Okay? You remember Jesus on the, night he, on the night in which he was betrayed and all of that. Okay? But also there's a focus on each other. You wait for one another. You you uh, commune together in fellowship around the Lord's table. Okay, so I think this is, we'll, we'll spend a few minutes, have a few minutes set aside to, uh, to do this here. Um, let's talk about how this applies. We're trying to make the applications from 1 Corinthians match ours. Um, and I asked you this question to think about on Sunday when I want us to discuss it now. Um, Paul is addressing certain problems in Corinth that I think on the surface may seem foreign to us. I mean, we're not meeting in homes. Uh, unless y'all are leaving me out, I don't think anyone's gathering here at like 8.30 to like, you know, gorge on a feast of bread and wine before the rest of us get here and get those little cups, you know. Um, so how then could we make any application from the problem and the remedies of Paul in these, section, these verses in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, I'd like to hear from you on that. And Terry's got one, so we'll start there. Uh, but again, think about what might we need to learn or take from these verses that do apply to our situation, uh, even if the externals are different than Corinth. Yes, Terry. It goes back to the abuse of the Lord's Supper. Uh, instead of getting together and making it a common meal, as it was argued, they there to go back to what Paul was saying that Jesus was betrayed that night he suffered for all of us and his body was broken and his blood was shed for our sins and we are to remember those things and reflect upon those things and that's what 
makes the Lord's Supper so significant in Corinth, but also so significant for all of us today. Remember and reflect, Terry encourages us. Thank you, Terry. Um, other thoughts? Uh, specifically, you know, any way that these problems manifest themselves um, for us? Jordan, go for it. Yeah, so I think the, um, the principle they had, um, some would come early, some would come late, leftovers, the prioritization, I think, sometimes that we can get caught up in that in terms of um, maybe our, our focus or lack of focus specifically, that hey, I'm here, I'm doing this, um, this is about me, this is about um, uh, something that's focused solely on me, and we miss the, brought to your point a second, the broader communion we share with each other. Um, which again, I, I think, you know, to be fair, the focus on our relationship with the Lord, I mean, yes, that's very uh, critical, right? Uh, uh, but I think, you know, just speaking individually, of course, um, I would think sometimes uh, maybe losing the focus of the broader communion we share with each other. Losing the focus of communion with each other, of thinking solely about ourselves, even in a, in a good way if we miss the other side of it, Jordan uh, says. Other, other thoughts? I'll suggest this, and uh, you can take it or leave it. Um, but... You know, let's think about what Terry and Jordan have both said, you know, making sure the focus is where it's supposed to be on the Lord and on other people. And all of that means not on ourselves. Um, yeah, maybe our taking of the Lord's Supper looks different enough to where we say, OK, I'm not seeing these same problems from 1 Corinthians 11. But what if we broadened it out a little bit more just to include the Sunday gathering in general? OK, uh, is it a danger that in preparing to come on Sundays and getting dressed, and getting ready, and showing up at all? Uh, is it a danger that our focus would be on me, how I look, how I appear, making sure I am seen by other people? Uh, whether it's that kind of, you know, uh, attitude, or maybe even just, maybe this goes along with, with Jordan's point, you know, I'm punching my ticket for worshiping God on Sunday like I'm commanded to do, and I'm not even really conscious of the fact that other people are, are around or that, you know, the purpose is to come together as a body. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the next section. But I, but I think if you take the principles of 1 Corinthians 11 uh, and the Lord's Supper passage and expand it out to meeting at all on Sundays, and, and am I here just to show off or to uh, maybe even, uh, not out of the realm of possibility, to look down on others that are not here or, or late or don't dress as nice as we do or whatever. Uh, I, I think there really are some important things to think about um, and maybe broadening it out helps us to see that a little bit clearer because uh, as is, uh, we've talked about, taking the Lord's Supper looks different. Yes, Alex. Just a, just a random thought. Um, I, I kind of am confused or maybe not confused. I just find it odd that all of these issues he's kind of bringing up, his solution is his wait for other people. That, it's like, therefore, wait for everyone. And that's going to fix it all, I guess. That's interesting. So uh, what, what strikes you as odd about it? Like, is it, is it odd because it's so, like, simple or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. I don't think I thought about that. Um, but uh, maybe what we would say is that, you know, the actual act of waiting is, is more loaded than just the time. It's, it's not just that Paul is saying you're taking it too early. In waiting for one another, you are kind of equalizing. You are, you know, showing honor. Um, we've all had that experience, right? Where, where people who are going to eat a meal that we're supposed to be at, you know, we get there and they're like, okay, we're going to start. Now that, you know, it's like we've been waiting for you. That, well, you're like, man, you don't need to do that. Like, that's a, it's a sign of honor. So maybe, especially in the context, Alex, you think about, uh, the, how powerful it would be for the rich and well-to-do to purposefully wait and not take their meal until the poor and the lowly come in and take their seats around the table. Um, and uh, it's like, hey, we saved a spot for you. Now that you're here, we're, we're a family, and we can you know, take the Lord's Supper. So, uh, so may, maybe that, that's kind of all loaded into that. Yeah, Albert. You did it. raise your hand, right? I wasn't making that up. Last word, I think. We'll give, give Albert the designation here. 
This slide always gets the last word. <laughs> uh, I see the word that we proclaim, and, and who are we proclaiming to? We're proclaiming to this world that we believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and we believe that he was crucified. We believe that he has risen. And so when we come together as a body, as a whole, it's encouraging, it's, it's strengthening me, knowing that as we take as, as a whole assembly, that we are proclaiming to this world um, that what we believe, what we will die for, and we will do it until he comes again. And so I, I see wisdom in God having us do that, that we gain strength from each other, and that we, we, we have that common bond, and that bond is the greatest gift that we could have uh, ever had and, and didn't deserve. And uh, our proclamation needs to be heartfelt. We don't need to be, oh, it's Memorial Day, great, we get to barbecue. No, you know, this world has set up secular holidays that many people don't remember what the actual purpose to memorial or to remember. And, and the Lord's Supper should not be that way in any way to us. And each Sunday, we need to reflect. We need to be refreshed. And we need to make sure that when you actually partake in it, that you are confident in, in proclaiming what it is that we're, we're honoring and remembering. Thank you, Albert. And uh, I think some of what Albert said will uh, segue us nicely into chapter 12. So let's do that uh, as we shift here to the section uh, concerning spiritual gifts. Um, we're going to read all of this. I think chapter 12 is, is fairly self-explanatory. Go back a little bit. We're entering into another one of these three chapter sections where, um, like in chapters 8, 9, and 10, remember chapter 8 was about food sacrifice to idols. Chapter 9 seemed like a detour, right? But really it was, it was kind of setting up the central point for the discussion. And then chapter 10 ended the discussion about meat sacrifice to idols with some more precise um, and detailed instructions. We're going to see the same thing in 12, 13, and 14. 12 will introduce, and, and it is, I think, fairly introductory. I think the, the, the points are, are self-explanatory to a large degree. Uh, setting up the idea of spiritual gifts and the main principles behind uh, the distribution and the use of spiritual gifts in a church. Uh, chapter 13 will seem like a detour, uh, maybe, or at least seems like it's on a different topic, but truly really not a different topic. It's the main topic. And then chapter 14 will come back and finish off a discussion of spiritual gifts with more specific and precise instructions. So um, let's read all of chapter 12 in one uh, straight uh, course here. And as we read, I want you to look for, uh, this is always a good idea in Bible study, but chapter 12, 1 Corinthians, look for the words, the phrases that just keep showing up. Repetition, repeated words, repeated phrases, and think about how, what that might say about Paul's main message uh, here in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries, the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. Verse 12, For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. 
If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the member which lacked, so that here there may be no division in the body, that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. One member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Verse 27, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. Are all, all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not get, have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak in tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. Okay, um, I want you guys to discuss here for a few minutes, uh, maybe three or four minutes, What are the repeated words and phrases in 1 Corinthians 12, and how does that help us to understand the main point of the passage? Go. Hopefully you had a chance to elaborate on some of these things, how these repeated words, ideas, uh, help shape the message for Paul. But um, why don't we just shout out, uh, what are some of the words and phrases that show up over and over again in the chapter? Body, Michael says. What else? Same? Less than, greater than? Humbert says. Members? Body, members, same. Spirit? One? Yeah, we'll put that with same, right? Uh, uh, I mean, not that they're the same, but... Uh, that same grouping there. Uh, same one, body members, spirit, less than, greater than. Anything else you guys found? Honorable, and maybe it's counterpart. Is that, I'm curious, Albert, is that uh, similar to the, what you were uh, saying about less than, greater than, the honorable, the more honorable, less honorable, that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay, um, Cool. Well, let's uh, talk about these verses. If you have things uh, to to ask about as we go, uh, just raise your hand um, or to add in. um, I welcome it. But uh, let's go through this in two sections. First, chapter 12, 1 to 11. And uh, the first few verses are actually, in some ways, maybe some of the more confusing verses in the chapter. Um, Paul begins with a little bit of another jab that we've seen before. I do not want you to be unaware. Remember, they thought they were so smart, but yet Paul finds ways throughout the book to say, hey, you're missing something here. Okay. But verse 2 and 3, he talks about coming out of paganism. I think he's referring especially to the Gentiles. Uh, and they served mute idols. Not only is that uh, thing the prophets love to talk about, the idols can't speak, they can't move, But it's also significant in contrast with the spirit who empowers uh, his people to speak. Okay, Um, But in speaking, verse 3, the spirit works in people. And there's a debate about whether the first few verses here, you know, is this only in regards to spiritual gifts or can it be more broad than that? I think either way, the point is the spirit works for one common goal. Uh, We shouldn't think of this as the literal words, like, you know, uh, people wouldn't say the literal words, Jesus is accursed, if they're, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I mean, I think that's true, but why would anyone say those words, Jesus is accursed, and claim to be speaking by the Holy Spirit, okay? I think the idea is that the content of what they're saying can't be a denial of or blasphemy against Jesus, right, if they are in the Spirit, again, whether miraculously or not, um, 
But anyone who is in the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, speaking by the Spirit, is going to affirm the Lordship of Jesus. Again, not the literal words only. Okay? Remember, Jesus himself said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. Okay? It's those who do the will. It's those who do submit to Jesus, not just say so. Okay? So the idea is those that are led by the Spirit or speak by the Spirit, when the Spirit works in people, there is a common goal, and that is to uh, submit to the Lordship of Jesus. That's what this is all about. Okay, and that's going to be in contrast to how they have begun to use the spiritual gifts to promote themselves and not glorify God. Okay? Um, we have a nice little uh, layout of the, the Trinity, as it comes to be called, uh, in verses 4, 5, and 6. He said that these varieties of gifts come from the same Spirit, these varieties of ministry— come from the same Lord, that is, again, the Lord Jesus, and these varieties of effects uh, really are moved by the same power that is the power of God. Uh, so that's cool to see that, but notice the intentional joining together here of variety and sameness. Okay? The gifts are different. There is diversity within the body in that there are different things that people do, different ways that they serve, different gifts that they have. Um, but all of that is from the same place, for the same purpose, empowered by the same God. Okay? So, uh, unity within the diversity or diversity within unity of the body. Okay? Um, but he uses the phrase in some ways, verse 7 is, is really, you know, could summarize this whole section, 12, 13, and 14. Each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. If we're all on the same team, verse 3, right, we're all... If we're in the Spirit, we're, we're affirming Jesus' lordship. We're all on the same team for the same goal. We've all been empowered by the same God, uh, given gifts by the same Spirit, serving the same Lord. And then whatever gift we have, we use it for the common good. And then he goes through and lists, verses 8 to 10, uh, the various gifts that might be given. Um, and then ends that section by saying that, again, in verse 11, it's the same Spirit who works in all these things. Okay. Uh, stop me if you need to, but we'll continue on. Uh, verse 12 and following is where he starts to elaborate on the body metaphor. Okay? Verse 12 and 13. Um, one body, many members. And all the members of the body are, are many, but are one. So again, before we had you know, diversity and unity, there's a variety of gifts, but it's the same spirit, same Lord, same God. Here we have, we're many, but we're one. We're one, but we're many, okay? Um, notice uh, the, in verse 13, the connection, and y'all had just done Galatians before this, so you remember in Galatians, the connection in chapter 3, uh, if you're baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ, therefore there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Same thing here, okay? We have been united in Christ, okay, through baptism, therefore, okay, these distinctions go away, whatever they are. So I thought we were different. Well, we are different, but we're, you know, uh, all in, in the same, um, same uh, uh, place here. That is, baptized into God, drinking from the same Spirit, many members, one body. All right. Then uh, there's basically, if all this is true, okay, that we're a part of a body, and Paul is intending for us to see very visually and even graphically the human body as a metaphor here. Okay? If we are all members of one body, that is the body of Christ, then there's two things Paul is going to highlight that you cannot say uh, or attitudes that you cannot have in the body. First, he says in 14 to 16, you can't say, well, I am not needed because I am not a whatever. Okay? I think this is, this is real. I think we oftentimes look around and say, well, I'm not that, you know, uh, I'll say it again, I'm sure, but we have too much of a hang-up and an obsession with the person who's up in the front, the people who are seen, the people whose names are on the sign, so to speak, okay? Paul's going to say, who cares, right? Um, but the tendency is to look at whatever it is. You know, there's some of y'all that I look at and think, man, if I could do that. Uh, I'm not needed because I am not whatever it is. Paul said you can't say that. Why not? Well, because every member adds value. Um, and it's silly to think that one member 
or one function could serve for all of it, okay? Uh, maybe you're thinking of Mike Wazowski, right? The one-eyed monster, okay? Maybe, probably not. You're thinking, of, is, it, uh, is it Ralph Waldo Emerson, I think, and the floating eyeball? So if anybody here is real big into the transcendentalist, you know. Uh, so you can't just be a, an eyeball. You can't just be a hand, you know, if you're picturing a disembodied hand. Um, Every member adds value. No one member is sufficient. And so you can't say, well, I'm not needed because I don't do that. The other thing you can't say, verse 21, is to somebody else, you are not needed because you don't do X, Y, Z, what I do. Okay? And this is where we started to see some of these status distinctions. And so uh, let's spend a few minutes talking about Paul's answer from 22 to 26. He basically says, you can't look down at other people and say, oh, you're not needed because you're not like me. You, know, you don't bring what I bring, you know. Uh, whatever those distinctions are, if they're status, if it's wealth, if it's education, whatever those categories we've already t- talked about in this class, you can't say that. He does something interesting with the metaphor of the body here in 22 to 26. Okay? He says, on the contrary, it's much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, are less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. Okay, what's he talking about? I think there's a couple ways. Maybe Paul is is doing all of this, or maybe it's one or the other. I'm not sure. One way to think of it, especially when he talks about, you know, less presentable, uh, we have a term for that that actually fits. We call it our private parts, okay? The parts of us that we would not show at all, and we're ashamed of these parts, And yet, how do we treat them? We cover them up. Paul describes that as showing honor, okay? Um, Or maybe he's going a different direction, which is there are parts of our bodies that are very weak, very fragile. um, And for that reason, maybe they're hidden, right? They're like our internal organs. But if something's wrong with it, okay? Think about like the least, what's the least glamorous part of our body? Is it like, you know, the gallbladder or the, you know, the small intestine? I mean, I don't know. We could do a poll, you know? But if you've had issues with any of that stuff, you know, I was just with a friend yesterday, you know, he's having gallbladder problems and it's really causing him a lot of pain and, and difficulty. Okay, so we have these parts of our body that we think, oh, that's nasty. That's, that's uh, you know, we don't want to talk about, we don't even want to say it. You guys, some of you guys are blushing, you know, because I said private parts, you know. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it. You know, it's too embarrassing. But Okay, so what's Paul saying here? He's saying if our tendency is to look down on certain people in the church and saying, oh, we don't, we don't really talk about them, you know, we don't really pay much attention to them, or, you know, uh, we look, we're, we're tempted to, to think about them a certain way, again, because of their appearance, because of their status, because of their socioeconomic uh, status, whatever it is, okay? He says that's really totally backwards. He says really a part that's weaker, a part that's uh, less honorable, those are the very people that we have to be paying attention to and focusing on and honoring and waiting for, Alex, right? You wait for them. You honor them. You protect them. If they're weak, then they need help. If they're on the fringe, then they need a friend. They need someone to put their arm around them and say, I'm your brother. I'm your sister, okay? Um, we get this backwards, I think, is what Paul is saying. Uh, we, uh, uh, but if we were like the body— then we wouldn't operate that way, okay? Um, And he gets uh, more specific about that when he says, uh, you know, so he says, verse 24, just keep going here. God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the members that lacked. Okay, so that's how God has designed it in the church. So that there would be no division, but that the members had the same care for one another. Notice verse 26. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So my friend yesterday, you know, he doesn't go around saying, yeah, my gallbladder's like really struggling, but that's just my gallbladder. So I'm, it's, you know, it's fine. You know, it's no big deal. Take it or leave it. Um, you don't say, oh, I, you know, I just got this one little vertebra that's like shattered. But it's, you know, it's just one, it's just one little vertebra, so who cares? You know? uh, no, that, that if one member suffers, no matter how small or insignificant we might think it is, again, uh, many of us know this from our own experience with our own bodies, one little member suffers the whole body suffers, and that's all you can think about, and that's all you're consumed with, okay? We cannot afford to say, oh, well, that's just so-and-so. You know, I haven't seen them in months, but, you know, 
that's just that that's they don't they're not around much or you know oh they have their problems or whatever or we don't even think about them we don't even know their name maybe okay um paul says that's that's not the way a body operates okay um but he says uh the body shows honor when a member suffer or sorry uh, suffers with a member when it suffers, rejoices when they rejoice. It's a way of showing honor to each other as interconnected, interdependent members of the same body. Okay. Then in 27 to 31, he gives another list. You are Christ's body, individually members of it, and he's appointed these certain things. Okay. Um, I think I still have like 60 seconds. So as a way to transition into chapter 13 and then 14, uh, we have two lists here. Chapter uh, 12, verse 8 to 10 is one list of the gifts that God has given through the Spirit. And then verses 27 to 31 uh, is another list okay, of the various gifts. Uh, do you notice on each of those lists something similar about the order, particularly about what comes last? Speaking in tongues is the last thing mentioned on both of the lists. What we're going to see, especially in the chapter 14, which Rick's going to uh, teach while I'm uh, gone, okay? The Corinthians like to exalt certain gifts over the other, and they like tongues the best, it seems. So Paul is not just giving a list. He seems to be giving a list that has, has a purpose, and we'll talk about what that purpose is, but one of the purposes seems to be to uh, kind of downplay tongues a little bit and emphasize some of the other things, okay? But he says in further one, I will show you a more excellent way. And that's what we'll get to on 13. We finish. We have caught up. We will start Sunday with a quiz, probably, and then square into chapter 13, just like I drew it up. Thank you, guys.